to all of my Trinitarian friends out there. I love you, but I need to tell you today that God isn't a trinity of persons. He's only numerically one being. I'm not questioning your love for God, your sincerity, or any experiences that you may have had with God. But in this video today, I want to try and explain by the grace of God, how that God isn't a trinity of persons, but he's only one numeric being. Jesus told us in Matthew's Gospel 24, that in the last days many false prophets would arise and deceive many. Notice that it's the many that will be deceived, but it's the few that will have the truth. Eternity is too long to get it wrong. Uh, the scriptural quotations today are coming from the authorised King James Bible, because it's the Bible that's supported by the majority of manuscript evidence. The scripture says that God is a spirit, John chapter 4 verse 24 God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth the first mention of the term trinity was by a man called Tertullian who was born sometime around 155 AD and died sometime after 229 AD Trinitarianism became the official doctrine of Christendom at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD under Emperor Constantine. Now the foundation for understanding whether or not God is one being or three persons is to be found in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 Hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 14 Thus saith the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon, and have brought down all their nobles, and the Chaldeans whose cry is in the ships. Isaiah 43 verse 15 I am the Lord your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Isaiah 44 verse 6 Thus saith the Lord the King of Israel, and his Redeemer the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Isaiah 44 verse 8 Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God, I know not any. Isaiah 44 verse 24 Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. We can see from these scriptures that God is continually emphasising his oneness, not his threeness. He doesn't refer to himself as the Holy Three of Israel, but the Holy One. The Old Testament writers, from Moses to Malachi, were Jewish monotheists, they believed that God was one numeric being, not a trinity of persons. Now the first Christians were Jews. They believed that God was one numeric being. And when they got converted to Christianity, they didn't change that view. They remained oneness monotheists. John chapter 20 verse 28. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Notice that Jesus didn't rebuke Thomas for referring to him as his Lord and his God, as a monotheistic Jew. Neither was Thomas stoned to death for blasphemy. Both the Old and New Testament writers had a better understanding of the Hebrew and Greek languages than anyone alive today, and yet they continued to believe that God was numerically only one being and not a trinity of persons. Revelation chapter 4 verse 2 And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Revelation chapter 4 verse 3 And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Revelation chapter 4 verse 8 and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, 
and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Notice how there's only one throne in heaven and only one God sitting on the throne. Now, Trinitarianism has become the dominant belief in Christendom. However, the Bible shows that God's people are always in the minority. Notice how God saved eight people in the ark, and yet a whole world was destroyed by the flood. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Verse 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. God is not concerned with majority opinion, but rather he's concerned with truth. The Old Testament foretold that this same one God would one day come into the world as a man, Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 35 verse 4 Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Verse 6. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. Jesus is the fulfilment of these scriptures because he is both the Son and the Everlasting Father, and the aforementioned miracles were fulfilled in his ministry. If God were a trinity of persons, then the following scriptures would teach that Jesus Christ has two fathers. God the Holy Ghost would be the father of the child, and God the Father would also be the father of the child. Matthew chapter 1 verse 18 now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. This verse declares that the Holy Ghost is the father of the Son. Matthew chapter 16 verse 17 And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. The Trinity doctrine teaches that God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Ghost are co-equal and co-eternal persons. The term Son of God refers to the body. The terms Father and Holy Ghost refer to one and the same Spirit that dwelt within that body. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Verse 6, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Someone might say, how can Jesus be both the Father and the Son at the same time? In the same way, that he can be both the root and the offspring of David at the same time. Revelation chapter 22 verse 16 I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, now according to the Spirit, Jesus is David's generator 
which means father or creator. And according to the flesh, Jesus is David's offspring, which means his son. Since God is omnipresent, he manifested himself in three different ways at the same time. At the River Jordan, when Jesus was baptised, there was a voice that came from heaven and the Holy Ghost descended in the form of a dove, while Jesus in bodily form stood in the waters of the River Jordan. Matthew chapter 3 verse 16 And Jesus, when he was baptised, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him verse 17 and lo a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased the jewish gospel writers of matthew mark and john weren't suddenly shocked into believing that god was a trinity of persons and suddenly rejecting their oneness belief but they understood that they were now dealing with an omnipresent god who was now manifest in the flesh we have a similar situation in the Old Testament. When the three men appeared to Abraham, one of them was God, the other two were angels. And also when God appeared to Jacob in bodily form and wrestled with him at Peniel, they didn't suddenly reject their oneness belief and suddenly start believing that God was two persons because he'd now manifested himself in bodily form. They remained monotheistic oneness believers in God. It's great to hear that so many of you out there who are Jewish are now accepting Jesus as your Messiah, but there's absolutely no need to reject your monotheistic beliefs that you once held and start embracing the false concept of Trinitarianism. The only one who was in the position to be able to redeem mankind was God himself. So God took on the role of the Son of God not God the Son, and was manifested in bodily form on earth, while at the same time maintaining his omnipresence as a spirit. Psalm 139, verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Verse 8. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. God could appear to all seven billion people on earth at the same time and in different forms, and still only be one being. Now if God chose to do that, we wouldn't say that there are seven billion persons in the Godhead. I'm now going to try and explain by the grace of God how God was manifest in the flesh. John chapter 1 verse 1 In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The question becomes, what is God's Word? God's Word is his voice, and not a separate person. Psalm 29 verse 5 The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars, yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. Psalm 33 verse 6 by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Verse 9. For he spake and it was done, he commanded and it stood fast. If a person called John called you on the phone, you wouldn't say that John's word or John's voice is on the phone. You'd say that John is on the phone. Because as human beings, we don't make a distinction between a person and their voice. And likewise, there's no distinction between God and his voice or God and his word. John chapter 1 verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 1 John chapter 1 verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Verse 2. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life 
which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. The words of human beings are powerful, but they have their limitations. You can hear my words, but you can't see them or handle them. God's word has no such limitations. God can speak, and not only can you hear God's word, but God, God can make his word both visible and tangible, that you can see it and also touch it. God's word became a body that could be visibly seen and also physically handled. God literally became a body called the Son of God, while at the same time maintaining his omnipresence as a spirit. Water and ice are one and the same substance, but when water is in its solid form, we no longer call it water, we call it ice because it's in a different form. God, as the Father, we call him Father. But when God makes himself solid, we refer to him as the Son of God because now he's in his solid form. Now Jesus himself tells us that his flesh came from heaven. John chapter 6 verse 51 I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus Christ's own words tell us that the bread came from heaven and that the bread he was referring to is his flesh. Therefore, his flesh comes from heaven and doesn't have its origins in Mary's body. Mary was Jesus' mother in the sense that he implanted his body inside her womb and then nine months later came forth from her body. But she wasn't his mother in the sense that any of her substance was a part of his body. If Jesus had any of Mary's substance in his body, his body would have had sin in it and he couldn't have been an acceptable sacrifice for our sins because in order for Jesus to be the spotless Lamb of God, his flesh couldn't have been tainted with sin. But if his flesh had any part of Mary's substance in it, it would have been tainted with sin. Regardless of what the Roman Catholic religion wants to say, Mary was born in sin like everybody else, and she even confessed her sinfulness when she prayed to God. This is why Jesus never addressed Mary as mother, but always referred to her as woman. Luke chapter 1 verse 46 And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour. Now you only need a saviour if you're born in sin. Now if Jesus' body was made of the dust of the earth like every other human being, then when his body lay for three days in the grave, his body would have started to decay just like Lazarus' body when he lay dead in the tomb. John chapter 11 verse 39 Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Acts chapter 2 verse 31 He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. The reason that Jesus' flesh didn't rot and decay while it lay in the grave was because his body was made of the incorruptible word of God. The word of God is the only incorruptible substance, as we read in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth for ever. Now Paul tells us that Jesus was made in the likeness of men. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Philippians chapter 2 verse 7 
but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross now imagine that you've got two bibles the one bible cover is made of leather the other bible cover is made of imitation leather they're both bible covers they both look identical but they're made of different substances the one substance of leather is superior and the other substance of imitation leather is inferior now Jesus body was made of the word of God our body is made of the dust of the earth the word of God is superior to dust both of them are flesh but the one is superior flesh to the other the one is corruptible the other is incorruptible and that's why Jesus body didn't decay or rot a natural analogy might help us understand how God was manifest in the flesh. A silkworm spins silk from inside its own being and then cocoons itself in its own substance. Now what the silkworm does naturally is exactly what God did spiritually. God spoke his own word out of his own being, formed a body and then the spirit of God dwelt inside that body which was made of his own substance now in the old testament the temple that solomon built was called by the same name as the god who dwelt in the temple now solomon's temple was a type and shadow of the body of jesus christ first kings chapter 8 verse 43 hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all people of the earth may know thy name, to fear thee, as do thy people Israel, that they may know that this house which I have builded is called by thy name. John chapter 2, verses 19 and 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But he spake of the temple of his body. This was typifying that the Son, who is the temple, is called by the same name as the Father who dwelt in the temple. As we saw earlier, the terms Father and Holy Ghost refer to one and the same Spirit. John chapter 14 verse 10 but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. So we can see that Jesus, as the Son of God, the temple, is called by the same name as the God who dwelt in the temple. And this is why the apostles never used a trinitarian formula for water baptism when we go into the book of acts of the apostles even though jesus told the apostles to baptize candidates in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost the apostles had the revelation that jesus is the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost and that's why the apostles continually in the book of acts baptized candidates in the name of Jesus Christ or in the name of the Lord Jesus but that's a subject for another video now you might be saying now after listening to all that I've said I agree with what you've said but if I leave my Trinitarian Church I've got too much to lose my family worship there and they'll be upset if I leave I hold a church office there and I can't afford to leave because I'll lose my reputation and I'll lose my prestige of the high church office that I hold in my Trinitarian church. If I leave my Trinitarian church, I've just got too much to lose. Now, the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. He was highly esteemed in the Jewish religion. And yet when the truth came to him and was revealed to him on the Damascus Road, 
He left his Jewish religion and turned his back on it and he never regretted it. He lost his prestige among his Jewish peers but he never regretted a moment of it. Now Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3 verse 8 Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Now there are many people in the true apostolic church who were once in the Trinitarian church, but once the truth was revealed to them, they left it behind, and they have no regrets. It's better to lose your prestige here on earth than to lose your soul for all eternity. I just want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to what I had to say today. I hope that you will consider what I've said, pray about it, and that you likewise will get the revelation that God is not a trinity of persons, but he is numerically only one being, who was manifested in the flesh as Jesus Christ. God bless you all and have a great day. Please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification so that when I upload my next video, you'll be notified.